Just so you know, Christina and I are leaving for a vacation on Tuesday. It's the first vacation, literally, we've had, I think, in 10 years. We've taken many mission trips to Haiti, to India, and to other places around the world, but as you know, if you've been on a mission trip, it is not a vacation. And the Lord has just uh, impressed on us that we need to take a break. So we're going, we're going to be uh, going to Europe. We've got a wonderful itinerary plan. We're going with a wonderful couple for the first uh, 10 days or so. And, uh, and Billy is going to preach next Sunday. And then the Sunday following on the 29th, uh, Dr. Dennis Ockholm, who is going to be the men's retreat leader in the fall in October out at Ironwood, is coming to preach. He's a very popular professor at uh, Azusa Pacific University and at Fuller Seminary. He's a dear friend. He's got a great sense of humor. You will love hearing him. Don't miss his sermon. And don't miss Billy. And the following Sunday, as we're flying back, he's going to be preaching for, for us. And uh, friends, you are in good hands. Let us pray. Lord, I thank you for your faithfulness. And Lord, I thank you for vacations and breaks and times of rest. I pray for so many in our own congregation, some of whom are on vacations right now. Protect them, bless them. And Lord, I just thank you. I thank you for this congregation and for their love of you and of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. When you look at all the examples in the Gospels of Jesus, and when he encountered everyday folks from all walks of life, you will discover that meeting Jesus changed the lives of most of them. Not all, but most of them. For example, Nathaniel was a skeptic who became a disciple of Jesus. Peter, the fisherman, became a great church leader and a fisher of men. The apostle Paul, who had persecuted the church and who met Jesus on the road to Damascus, became the greatest missionary of the church who led its expansion all over the ancient world, and lives were changed. It's interesting that as you examine the lives that Jesus changed in the New Testament, Jesus does not primarily come across as an example to be followed. His job was not to model for us the answers to the big questions in life. He's not even primarily a teacher telling us or giving us the answers to those questions. No, he comes as a savior to be the answer to the big questions. To do for us what we could not hope to do on our own. And if you want our lives to be changed forever too, we need to encounter him as a savior. Not just as a great teacher. And in order to do that, we need to understand and see what he did for us. If I were to ask you what two or three events in Jesus' life are key to that understanding, I believe many of you would mention the best known events in his life, his birth, his death on the cross, and his resurrection. These events are most familiar to us and we understand their importance. For example, without the incarnation, Jesus could not have become human and taken our punishment. The crucifixion means that there's a solution for guilt. There is pardon for us. The resurrection means we will eventually get brand new bodies that will signal our triumph over death. All of these are great and miraculous events of Jesus' life, and they're obviously critical. But what I want to do this morning is to look at some less well-known incidents in his life that hopefully will take us even deeper into what Jesus did to save us. What I want to look at today is how Jesus overcame evil for us. 
And we'll do that by looking at how Jesus' public life was launched, how it all began. There are two events that happened back to back to Jesus that prepared him for the single most world-changing career in history. In three of the four Gospels, these incidents, Jesus' baptism and his subsequent temptation by Satan in the desert, are presented together, and I believe for good reason. Here is how it happened according to Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 to 17, and from Matthew 4, verses 1 to 11. Listen for God's word to you. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And then immediately, the new chapter begins. Chapter, verse, chapter 4, verse 1. Then... Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the, if, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands and so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him. And I love this part. And angels came and attended him. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. Amen. Thanks be to God. Outside of the crucifixion itself, the baptism is the only event of Jesus' life mentioned in all four Gospels. I want to repeat that. Outside of the crucifixion itself, the baptism of Jesus is the only event of his life mentioned in all four Gospels. It is that crucial. But only here in Matthew is the temptation scene recorded in some detail. And it is important to recognize how the baptism and the temptation are connected tightly by the single word, then. God spoke words of powerful assurance. This is my son whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. Then is almost like a therefore. After great blessings and success and affirmation came trial and temptation. Have you ever noticed that no one can ever seem to secure a life of sustained success and joy and blessing? 
As hard as we try, no matter what precautions we take, no matter how well things are going, something often comes in and ruins it. You lose your job. The husband leaves. Whatever the issue may be, maybe it's a health issue. Even the most talented, diligent, and savvy people can't escape the undulations in life. Now, some of you may say, ah, oh, Pastor Dennis, but what if we did our part better? What if we lived good lives and obeyed God and prayed every day, asking him to protect us from all suffering and difficulty? And maybe you do. The answer is fine. We should go there. But what if you actually could overcome all of your faults and flaws? What if you could become perfectly wise and understand God's ways, the human heart, and the times and seasons such that you always, always made wise decisions? What if you could have faith in God without wavering? What if your life were perfectly pleasing to God? Then surely God would protect you and your own holiness and wisdom would guard you as well and your life would always go well. Right? Wrong. Because here stands the one who did it. God the Father has just said that Jesus' life is perfectly pleasing to him. And the Spirit of God has descended on him to guide him. And then look what happens. He is loved and affirmed and empowered by God, and then, then he is ushered into the clutches of the devil. So here's the order. God's love and power, then evil, temptation, wilderness, terrible hunger, and thirst. That little word, then, is an amazing word. It's almost like Matthew is trying to tell us, read my lips. No one is exempt from trials and tribulations. In fact, this is often what happens to people God loves very much, for it is part of God's often mysterious and good plan for turning us into something better and greater. Amen. This all goes to tell us, by the way, that Job's friends were wrong. You may remember that in the book of Job, Job seemed to be living an exemplary life, and then virtually everything in his life that could go wrong did go wrong. He lost his family, all of his considerable fortune, and his health. He was sent, as it were, into the wilderness, and there was no water like this water. Lovely waterfall, David. You really did outdid yourself. In fact, my feet are getting wet. Job's friends came to see him, saw what was happening, and essentially said to him, look, Job, our lives are the product of our choices. If you choose to live right and well, your life will go right and well. If God loved you, he wouldn't let such things happen. He must be mad at you and the choices you've made. This is how many people think, right? Maybe even most people, when people who are middle class or upper class and look at the poor, they assume sometimes the poor just aren't working as hard as they are. When people in wealthy families look at people with struggling and dysfunctional ones, they assume that they haven't cared enough to do things right. If we're not suffering at the moment, there is a tendency for us to take credit for it in our minds. It's not luck or grace. It's because we are living good and smart lives, right? But in Matthew 3, we see that the one person in the history of the world who really did leave, live a good life, even a perfect life, and merited the full love of God, he actually earned a pass from suffering and inconvenience, yet his life went terribly. And this temptation scene is just the start, just the opening act. There will be a steady progression of rejection, attempts on his life, betrayal, poverty, grief, loss, torture, and finally death. 
He will be tried and executed in an act of injustice. Everything will go wrong for Jesus from this point. So what does that tell us? What can we learn from all this? One thing it demonstrates is the power and the complexity and the intractability of evil in the world. Secular people see the world as made up of strictly material forces. They believe there is no soul or spirit, no demons or angels. Everything to them has a natural scientific explanation. And in this view, we can deal with evil in the world, they say, if there is even such a thing. By educating the ignorant, that's what we need to do. We need to challenge the social systems, provide better psychological and pharmacological treatment. Yet time and again over the last century, Western thinkers have been shocked anew by the depth and power of the forces of evil in the human heart and in the world. One of the places Christina and I are going is we're going to go to Warsaw and we're going to go visit the tragic place where so many Jews were burned in the ovens. We want to experience that a little bit to get an understanding of how evil the world can be. What does the Bible say about evil? It says that evil is more multidimensional, it is nuanced and complex than the sciences alone can suggest. It maintains that in addition to systematic injustices and personal ignorance and physiological imbalances, there really are forces of spiritual evil in the world. And behind them all, there is a singular supernatural intelligence. That's what the Bible says. The Western secular world has rejected this dimension of evil as portrayed in the Bible, and as a result, like Job's friends, are always underestimating and sometimes misdiagnosing the power of evil in our lives. For example, deep down, we cling to the simplistic idea that if we are good, Life will go well. Yes, if there are dem demonic forces, it stands to reason that true goodness and godliness would actually attract and stir up those powers to attack. And that is exactly what we see here in the baptism and temptation of Jesus. Let me add this. To believe that moral goodness will result in a good life is also a very simplistic understanding of God's purposes for us. We need to remember that God is infinitely wise, that he can see the end from the beginning and has good purposes for us hidden on the far side of the wilderness. Paul understood this, and he wrote in Romans 8:28, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. We love that verse. It's the water. It's the water that's him. <laughs> Just as Job's patience in suffering turned him into an example that has helped hundreds of millions of people who've read that story, and just as Jesus' temptations prepared him for his history-changing and world-saving career, so God's Spirit leads us into our wildernesses for our good. We need to remember that. We say that we believe this, but we were constantly being shocked by the intractability of evil in the world. Why? I think sometimes it's because we moderns see the Bible as, oh, you know, it's kind of primitive. And we do not really listen to its account of reality. So if the Bible is right, I deeply believe it is, and this kind of evil exists in the world, what good does it do us 
to understand more about evil. Well, when the Bible speaks about our encounters with the supernatural evil in life, it uses battle language. And if you don't know where the attack is going to come from, or if you underestimate or mischaracterize the enemy, you're likely to lose the battle. So if we do know what's out there and where it's coming from, how do we face it without being overwhelmed? Ever felt overwhelmed that there's nothing you can do about evil that is all around us? Let's consider what the text of Matthew 3 and 4 indicates. It tells us to face true evil, we need to answer at least three questions. One, who is the enemy? Where is the front of the attack coming from? And what is our best defense in this fight? First of all, who is the enemy? The Bible says that evil is complex and comprehensive. You can't confine it to human choices or in social systems or in psychological problems or in a simple lack of education. In fact, you can't even locate it fully within this whole set of forces taken together, nor can you take the scapegoating views that we have wreaked so much havoc in history, namely that evil is mainly caused by those people over there. Those people may be of a certain race and a class or nation or religion or political ideology. The Bible says that evil is both natural and supernatural. That evil is both inside of us and outside of us. That evil is both individual and socially systemic. Given its nature, there's no human way to get fully away from it or even get to the bottom of it in our understanding. How do you explain evil? Historically, there have been main, two main rivals to the biblical view that try to explain the nature of evil. On the one end, you have dualism. Dualism, which says there, there are equal and opposite forces of evil and good in the world. Reality fundamentally rests upon the clash between these two forces, good and evil, which will go on battling until the end of time or even eternally. That means that there is absolutely no triumph possible. In this view, God is not really any more powerful than Satan. Is that your view? When Christine and I were in India 18 months ago, we encountered Hindus who believe there are thousands and thousands of good gods and bad gods, good powers and bad powers. And one of the main gods being celebrated while we were there was the God of Wisdom, which is essentially a good god. Some of you who have read St. Augustine's city of God where he wrote about the pagan world as being dualistic, being made up of good and bad gods. This means that the world is fundamentally a violent place, not a place of order and beauty and hope. It also means that there's really no hope in the end for any way to resolve the struggle and to bring lasting peace. The other philosophical approach to evil is monism or pantheism, another word for it. This view goes to the other extreme and claims that all reality is one. Everything is part of God. God is everything, and therefore everything is ultimately one with everything else. Individual selves in this view are something of an illusion. We are all connected in a deep way, not just connected by a shared experience of humanity, but actually, in the end, indistinct from one another. C.S. Lewis, in his great book, Mere Christianity, said that the pantheist can look at a person dying of cancer or in extreme poverty and say, if you could only see it from the divine point of view, you would realize that this is also God. Evil and suffering then are not eternal and undefeatable, as in dualism. They don't even really exist. So we could say they are an illusion Two views of life, dualism and monism. 
It's interesting to observe that modern secular culture regards evil in a rather fragmented, incoherent way, borrowing from both of these views. On the one hand, secularism is like ancient polytheism in that it sees the world as not created by a single all-powerful artist, but as the result of violent and uncontrolled forces. Not only is the physical universe itself the product of an unending series of explosions and combustions, but we ourselves are only the products of evolution, of the survival of the fittest. If this account of the world is correct, then violence has no cure. It is the fabric of all reality. We got here through violent and purposeless means, and we will continue to exist and evolve in the same way. At the same time, many secular thinkers view human evil as the product of either bad social systems or psychological conditions. Much contemporary secular thought is relativistic. What looks like evil from a certain cultural perspective, it is said, goes away when looked at from another perspective. One man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. So evil is all in the eye of the beholder. If you look at it differently, in a way, it goes away. It's an illusion. So what is the Christian biblical view? Christianity gives you neither dualism or monism. Instead, it gives you an actual devil. If it is true that there are demonic forces out there, then the evil in the world cannot be reduced simply to human choices. There's some kind of force out there that magnifies and complicates and perpetuates the bad things that are happening in the social and psychological system of the world. Christianity says there is more evil than you can account for in the world just from the cumulative effect of wrong individual decisions. And some of that evil can be attributed to actual demonic forces. Isn't it funny? We know Jesus cast out demons, and he talked about them a lot, but we really don't think they exist in our culture, but they do, and it's one of the great lies of Satan. You should also know that Christianity is also not dualistic. The demonic forces are not the equal of God. The devil is a fallen angel leading fallen angels, and God is infinitely more powerful, as we sang a few moments ago. Our God can move mountains. Amen. The devil is a fallen angel, and in the very end, not only can God overcome them all, he certainly will. Amen. Sunday's coming. Maybe you think that the idea of the devil is a primitive idea, a belief for simple people. If that is your view, I would respectfully suggest that if you're trying to explain the world without the existence of the devil, then maybe maybe it is you who are being spiritually and intellectually naive. So if we know who the enemy is, the second question is to consider where is the front? What does the scriptures tell us beside the fact that there is a devil? The Bible tells us where the main front is, the main point of attack. Did you notice in our text this morning that several times the devil says, if you are the son of God? That is the devil's main attack, not only against Jesus, but against us as well. God has assured Jesus that he is God's beloved son, and Satan immediately and directly assaults Jesus at that very spot. He asks Jesus essentially to make God prove that he loves him and empowers him. 
But you don't need to ask someone for demonstrations and assurances and proofs unless you doubt. And that's Satan's main military goal. He wants Jesus to lose the certainty, the certainty, the assurance of God's full acceptance of his unconditional fatherly love. And he wants to do the same with you and me. Now, if that is Satan's main front of attack, how does he seek to accomplish that with us? To begin with, he wants to keep you and me from believing Jesus really is the Son of God and Savior of the world. Notice carefully what Jesus said from heaven and in in the baptism. First he says what God said, this is my Son whom I love. A quote from Psalm 2. It was a song about God's messianic king who was going to put down all rebellion and evil in the world. But then God says, with him I am well pleased. That is a quote from Isaiah 53 where it describes the figure of the suffering servant. A mysterious person who Isaiah says will someday suffer and die for the transgressions of all, all people. This is an important key to understanding the whole Bible. Throughout the Old Testament, as in Psalm 2, we find the promise of a great messianic king who would come and put everything right in the world. Many of the Jews awaited him eagerly, but there was also this suffering figure in the prophecy of Isaiah. The Jews were told that this servant would be rejected, that by his wounds we would be healed, Isaiah 53, 5. And no one, No one, until God blessed Jesus at the baptism, had put those two people together. Getting a better understanding of what Jesus has done for us. God was trying to get us to understand this. Jesus is not just a good man who by word and example tells us how to live. Nor is he merely a heavenly king who came to destroy all evil in one stroke. As we have seen, evil is deep within us. And if he had come to end all evil on the spot, he would have ended us. Instead, he is a king who comes not to a throne, but to a cross. He comes to be tempted and tried to suffer and die. Why? So we can receive God's love as a gift. And so if we rest in Christ's work for us, we can be adopted into God's family by grace, as it says in John 1, 12, yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gives the right to become children of God. It means that we can know that we are also God's beloved children and that in Christ we are well-pleasing to him. That assurance is the taproot of the deepest, most life-giving joy possible. On the one hand, it means that we now want to turn away from any sin or thing that displeases our Father. And on the other hand, the fear and anxieties and insecurities that haunted us begin to dissipate. Success and failure in our work neither puffs us up or devastates us. We are not driven by unhappiness over our looks or our status. We are not deflated by criticism as we were before. Our self-image rests in a love we cannot lose. Do you see why Satan would make this the main front of his attack? Satan wants at all costs to stop people from ever acquiring this kind of power. For people who don't believe Christianity, he aims to keep them blind as to who Jesus really is. He wants them to believe that Jesus, oh, is an especially nice man. For people who think they believe Christianity but don't understand that salvation is a free gift through Christ, Satan hopes to keep them ignorant of the gospel itself. He wants them confused about the fact that we are justified, put right with God by faith in Christ alone, not by our moral efforts. The third question that we need to ask is, what is our best defense in this fight 
Again, let's see what we can learn from the text. Notice the way Jesus uses the Bible. This is one of the most obvious messages of the passage. Jesus uses the Scripture every time he is assaulted by the devil. Amen. That strategy, of course, fits in with what we have just said about the front of the battle. Satan wants to destroy our grasp on the truth. But even more, he wants to affect the beliefs of our heart. According to the Bible, the heart is not just the seat of emotions, but the source of our fundamental commitments, hopes, and trust. And from the heart flows our thinking, our feelings, our actions, what the heart trusts, the mind justifies, the emotions desire, and the will carries out. If Satan can get you to consent with your mind to a God of loving grace, but get your heart to believe that you must do X, Y, and Z, in order to be a worthy, lovable, and valuable person, he will be most satisfied. This is why everything Satan says that insinuates or openly denies the promises and revelation of God is answered with Scripture itself. Even as Jesus was dying on the cross, when he was in his deepest agony, he quoted Psalm 22, 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When you are in moments of pain or shock, the things that come out of your mind and mouth are the most primal things in your being. And when Jesus was in such moments, out came the words of the Bible. Something like 10% of all the things he says in the Bible are quotations of or allusions to the Hebrew Scriptures. And when you know Scripture that well, you process all thoughts and feelings through a grid of biblical revelation. Now I have to ask you, if Jesus Christ, the Son of God, did not presume to face the forces of evil in the world without a profound knowledge of the Bible in mind and heart, how could we try to face evil in any other way? It's true that this takes a great deal of time and effort. <laughs> Worship, daily reading, meditation, memorization, singing, listening to teaching, all of these are necessary to become acquainted with the Scriptures as we must be. And when we are under attack, tempted to sin or to be discouraged or to just simply give up. It's then that we, need, we must wrestle the words and promises of the Bible into the center of our being. As it says in Colossians 3.16, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. Mm. Come on. But in conclusion, we have one more resource for this spiritual warfare. It's found in Hebrews 4, verses 15 and 16. It is Jesus himself. Hebrews 4, 15 tells us that Jesus is our great high priest. Priests were counselors and healers, and we're told that Jesus can empathize with our weaknesses and can give us mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. Why? How can he do that? Because he was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Amen. He is there to help us face the reality of evil, both inside and outside ourselves, having done it himself as a man. So as we fight lies in our hearts from Satan and his works in our world, Let's rely not only on the word of the Lord, but also on the Lord of the word. We don't simply have a book as perfect as it is. We have Jesus himself, who has been through fiery trials so intense that we cannot imagine them. And he's done it all for you and for me. Now that ought to generate a huge amen. 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 amen? Maybe even a hallelujah. hallelujah. Let me say it. Let me hear it one more time. Hallelujah. hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for thank you for the power of your word. We thank you for this little word called then. We have many thens in our lives. Things are going well, and then suddenly they don't. 
And it's during those moments, Lord, that we need to draw on your love. We need to draw on your words of holy scripture. We need to keep our focus on you, even as Jesus did when he was being attacked. So, Lord, give to each one of us this morning such a sense of hope in your word and in the presence of Jesus within us that we can face evil and look it straight in the face and tell the devil where he should go. He should go to hell where he belongs. So, Lord, give us strength as a family, as a congregation, as individuals. We love you. And we thank you for loving us first. And all of God's people said together, amen, amen. amen.